Good day and welcome to the International General Insurance Holdings LTD's second quarter and first half year 2023 Financial Results Conference Call. All participants are in listen-only mode. Should you need assistance, please signal a conference specialist by pressing the star key followed by zero. After today's presentation, there will be an opportunity to ask questions. To ask a question, you may press star, then 1 on your telephone keypad. To withdraw your question, please press star, then 2. Please note this event is being recorded. I would like now to turn the conference over to Robin Sitters, Head of Investor Relations. Please go ahead. Thanks, Alan, um, and good morning, everyone, and welcome to today's conference call. Uh, we'll be discussing our second quarter and half year 2023 results, uh, which you will have seen uh, on our website in the press release that we posted, uh, we issued after the market closed yesterday. If you'd like a copy of the press release, it's available in the investor section of our website at www.iginsure.com. We've also posted a supplementary investor presentation, which can be found on our website on the presentations page in the investor section as well. On today's call, our Executive Chairman of IGI, Wasif Jabshe, CEO, Waleed Jabshe, and Chief Financial Officer, Pervez Rizvi. Wasif will begin the call with some high-level comments before handing over to Waleed to talk through the key drivers of our results for the second quarter, 2023, um, and also give some insight into current market conditions and our outlook for the remainder of 2023. At that point, we'll open up the call for Q&A. Uh, but before handing over to... Uh, Wasif, I'll begin with the customary safe harbor language. Our speaker's remarks may contain forward-looking statements. Some of the forward-looking statements can be identified by the use of, the, by the use of forward-looking words. We caution you that such forward-looking statements should not be regarded as a representation by us that the future plans, estimates or, estimates or expectations contemplated by us will in fact be achieved. Forward-looking statements involve risks, uncertainties, and assumptions. Actual events or results may differ materially from those projected in the forward-looking statements due to a variety of factors, including the risk factors set forth in the company's annual report on Forms 20F for the year ended December 31, 2022, the company's reports on, on Form 6K, and other filings with the SEC, as well as our results press release, press release issued yesterday uh, after the close. We undertake no obligation to update or revise publicly any forward-looking statements which speak only as of the date they are made. In addition, as you are aware, we voluntarily changed our basis of accounting from IFRS to U.S. GAAP at the very beginning of 2023, January, January 1st. Um, during the call, we, we will use certain GAAP financial measures, measures for a reconciliation of non-GAAP financial measures to the nearest GAAP measure Please see our earnings release, which has been filed with the SEC and is available on our website. With that, I will turn the call over to our Executive Chairman, Wasif Jabshai. Um, thank you, Anna, and uh, good day, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us on today's call. Uh, we're going to be to do today's call a little bit differently. I'm going to have Walid uh, take the lead and talk you through the results for the second quarter and half year and what we are seeing in the markets. Um, as you know, I remain the executive chair and effective July 1, Walid took over the reins as CEO. This is part of succession plan that was put in place many years ago. Uh, well, it was uh, with me when I founded IGI in 2001, and he has played an important role in developing the IGI culture that has supported our long track record of success, including the exceptional results that we announced last night. This is a natural transition for us. As Walid has served as president alongside me for over a decade, IGI is in good hands with Walid at the helm. 
and uh, uh, the board and I look forward to continuing uh, to provide strong stewardship to the IGI group. Um, I want to congratulate our people on what are really exceptional results for the second quarter and first half of 23. Once again, it is the consistent and effective execution of our strategy. Knowing our capabilities and what we are good at, our deep understanding of markets, and being able to anticipate shifting trends in our markets that is leading to these consistent high quality uh, results. And here on this point, I'd like to add that uh, I watch the results of our peers in the market, and uh, I would say that IGI is superior to so many of them, and it's because of our understanding of the, mar of the market and the cycles and playing the cycles correctly. And this is what IGI has been uh, really great in achieving. Um, um, you know, we don't get attracted to business we, th we think we, you know, uh, is not making money for our shareholders. The market today for IGI remains one of the healthiest we've seen in many years. And there are plenty of opportunities to grow in certain lines and geographies. Our strategy is not to show growth just for the sake of being bigger companies, but to show profitable growth with business that we can service well for our clients. This means maintaining our focus and discipline and being selective about the business we are writing, when our markets are robust and especially when uh, they are not. And here on this point, I'd like to emphasize that the diversification of IGI portfolio geographically is so important and uh, this is what we concentrate on. Uh, and so many companies uh, like us in the market they miss that, and we hear it from them as well when we talk together. Um, before I hand over to Alit, I'd like to say thank you to all our stakeholders, but especially you, our shareholders, who have put your trust in IGI. I'm very pleased with what we have achieved since becoming a public company in 2020. We have compounded annual growth. In, in book value per share plus dividend by 11.4%, and tangible book value per share plus dividend by 11.1%. I expect IGI to continue on the same path under Walid's leadership. This is not to say that we won't ever have major events impacting our results. That is the nature of our business, and that is why we look at results over the longer term, uh, not just uh, quarter to quarter. I, I will now hand over to Alid, who will uh, take you through uh, the results and provide more details on our outlook for the remainder of 23. I'll remain on the call for any questions at the end. Thank you. Walid. Thank you, Wasif, and uh, thank you all for joining us today. Uh, um, as Wasif said, and as you saw from our press release last night, we, we've had another exceptional quarter and a very strong first half to the uh, 2023 year. We certainly don't expect to achieve mid-70s combined ratios and 30-plus ROEs every quarter. But what these results demonstrate is our ability to shift our focus to lines and territories showing the momentum and keep a watchful eye, and when required, even pull back in areas where we feel the right conditions just aren't there. For IGI, the strategy is critical, it always has been. We are relatively small in size, which is an advantage when it comes to moving quickly and decisively, and given the abundance of opportunities in many of our business, 
we were able to be selective, show healthy growth within our risk tolerances and appetite, and within our ability to service new business. I'll focus on some key highlights for the second quarter and first half. As a reminder, uh, you'll recall we did switch our basis of accounting to U.S. GAAP as of January 1st, so comparative numbers for the period may deviate from the numbers previously presented under uh, IFR. Uh, to the specifics, uh, gross premium growth remained strong at over 10% in the second quarter, leading to overall growth of more than 21% for the first half. Uh, similar to what we said in the first quarter, the opportunities we're seeing are primarily in the short tail and reinsurance segments, with competitive pressures remaining across most lines on the long tail side. Uh, specifically in the short tail segment, we recorded uh, just under 12% growth in gross premiums for the second quarter and just over 20% growth for the first half when compared to the same periods of last year. Growth in Q2 was in most short tail lines, the most significant, though, opportunities to, to write profitable business uh, and new business uh, are uh, where we're uh, and, and where we're achieving, you know, rate improvement on renewal business. That's most evident in property engineering and RPV portfolios. Our reinsurance treaty business was also up almost 40% over the second quarter of uh, 2022. Um, uh, and well more than double that of the first half of 2022 as we continued uh, to take advantage of the harding that we talked about on the call for last quarter's results. More important than the actual growth itself is the profitability, of course, of the increased level of premiums. A combined ratio of 73.5% for Q2 and 75.7% for the first half of this year are again well below our long-term average in the mid to high 80s. Overall, our profit for the second quarter of 23 was up more than 80% at $40.5 million and 68% at $74.4 million for the first half when compared to the same periods of last year. Net investment income, similar to the first quarter of 23, showed significant improvement in the second quarter. This is a result of the rising interest uh, rates on yields and reinvestment rates and an overall larger investment portfolio. This led to a 1.7 point improvement in the annualized investment yield to 3.9% for uh, the second quarter. When combined together, the first half of 23 was also significantly better than the first half in terms of uh, net investment uh, gain, with a 1.7 point improvement as well in investment yield to 3.7% for the first half. Uh, specifically, in our fixed in income portfolio, we improved the overall average credit rating to A and maintained the average duration at 3.1 years. Turning to the balance sheet, total assets are up 9.7% to, to over $1.7 billion, and total equity increased 13.6% to $466.8 million. On the capital management front, we continue to repurchase common shares under our existing 5 million common share repurchase authorization. We provided the specifics in our press release uh, from last night. Uh, we've got approximately 1.9 million shares left under the authorization. And as you know, we amended our dividend policy a year ago, and that remains in place. We are continually reviewing our options to manage capital, but as we've always said, our first priority is always to deploy the capital into the business where we believe we can achieve the best returns with any excess capital being returned to shareholders in various forms. All in, we delivered an annualized return on average equity of 36.1%, representing 12.6 points of improvement over the second quarter of last year, and an annualized core operating return on average equity of 34%, representing a three-point improvement over the second quarter of last year. For the first half of the year, return on average equity improved 10.5 points to 33.9%, while our core operating return on average equity improved 3.1 points to 30.8%. We grew our book value per share by more than 20% to $10.91 for the first half year to June 30th. 
2023. So all in, an excellent quarter and first half with lots to be excited about. I am specifically proud of our ability to continually generate consistent, profitable results and grow our book value per share. As was have said, while our quarterly results have been excellent so far this year, we are more focused on longer periods of time. And it's this multi-year track record that sets companies apart from each other. Before discussing what we're seeing in the markets, I just want to address the Warrant Exchange transaction that we announced. As you know, we commenced and are currently in the midst of an offering to exchange all 17 and a quarter million outstanding warrants for 95 cents per warrant. I won't comment much further, but I'm happy to take any questions on our rationale for a cash exchange versus a share exchange. But simply, the management and the board believe this was the best option as it is non-dilutive to existing shareholders. This is going to be reflected in our third quarter 2023 results, and I would remind listeners that we're already carrying $10.5 million liability on our balance sheets related to the warrants. So moving on to the market, it's fairly similar to what we said in last quarter's call, a bit with more pronounced or less pronounced trends in certain lines and geographies than we were anticipating. There are many areas of our portfolio with plenty of opportunities, but within this, rates and conditions do vary by line and by territory. So we we continue to see very healthy submission flow, which is allowing us to be allowing us to to uh, to be more selective in the risks we're taking on the books. So we continue to be optimistic about the momentum in our markets and the opportunities ahead, but particularly in our property engineering, political violence, and of course our treaty reinsurance book. Now that we're well into the second half of the year, our outlook remains positive. And for context, around 45 to 50% of our portfolio renews in the second half of the year. In our short tail lines, we saw cumulative net rate increases of of just under 10% in Q2, which is marginally better than what we saw in the first quarter. And the landscape here remains robust with good rate momentum in most lines, but as we mentioned on last quarter's call, general aviation continues to lag. There's much variation by line and territory, as I said. For instance, you've got power and renewables that are seeing cumulative net rate increases of, of around 3 to 4%, whereas you've got property that, uh, uh, with net rate increases of almost 15% and PV well over 30%. You know, uh, all, uh, and that on the back of the uh, geopolitical events of the past few uh, years. So every line is different, and the same goes for the various territories, which I'll talk about more in a moment. But the bottom line is there's still healthy opportunities out there, certainly for the near to, uh, to midterm. In our treaty reinsurance business, we saw cumulative net rate improvements of more than 27% in Q2. And that strong momentum continues. Uh, I mean, as we said on the last uh, quarter's call, there, these, these are some of the best conditions we've seen in, in the history of the company. As I noted earlier, gross uh, written premium was up more than 38% over the second quarter of 22, uh, driven mostly by the increased rating environment, of course, and new business in, uh, predominantly in the, in the U.S. and Europe. We're continuing to find plenty of opportunity to write new business and grow this portfolio. But again, as always, we're being selective and disciplined and working within our risk appetite, especially for uh, cat-exposed business. But as long as these favorable conditions uh, persist, you can expect this segment to become more and more a significant piece of our portfolio. It represented about uh, just over 13% of the total portfolio in the first half of the year, should come in at about 10% or level level out at about 10% for the full year which is roughly double historical levels. In the long tail segment, the story remains mixed, both by line and geographic region, as we continue seeing the impacts of competitive and pricing pressures. Overall, cumulative net rates remain in positive territory, but there is very much variation by line of business in this segment. 
For context's sake, I would note that most of these lines have had compound rate increases uh, well over uh, triple digits in the last uh, three to four years. So rate inadequacy remains at uh, acceptable levels. But renewal rates continue to be most pressured in DNO and uh, financial institutions, where we've seen another consecutive quarter of margin compression. General casualty lines are following this trend, albeit at a slower pace, uh, different geographies. Uh, so uh, we're still finding some good opportunities in the Middle East. Elsewhere, professional indemnity, as you all know, predominantly UK-based business is holding up and remains more than adequate uh, with net rate increases of uh, more than 3%. Although worryingly, the uh, trend for this uh, class of business is looking uh, similar to uh, uh, to other other lines within the segment. Overall, we will continue to take a cautious and selective approach to the business. Looking at uh, our geographic markets, the U.S. continues to outpace all our uh, all other markets with with rate increases of more than 20% in the lines we're writing. As you know, this is all short tail business, predominantly energy, property, and contingency. In the first half of the year, we've written just shy of 50 million of gross premium in the U.S. That represents uh, about 52% growth over the first half of uh, 2022. Um, Europe, where we're uh, mostly uh, writing long-tail business with a bit of short-tail and treaty business on the side, continues to be a bright spot. We expect to continue growth uh, for the rest of the year and into 2024 as we uh, build out our European platforms, which include um, uh, Oslo, um, uh, uh, which we announced in uh, acquisition of in Q1, um, working hard to expand our relationships and product, product offering in the uh, Nordic markets. Latin America continues to show healthy uh, rate momentum. In the Middle East, that market tends to be less correlated with other markets uh, around the world. Um, I mean, there we're seeing clear evidence of increased competitive pressures, uh, example, property lines, but there remain still good pockets of, uh, or pockets of good opportunities, uh, especially in engineering and political violence. Asia continues to show improvement, but uh, disappointingly, rate momentum in the second quarter was not quite as pronounced as we were expecting at the outset of the year. Um, all in, uh, positive though. Um, uh, in summary, as I said, uh, we remain optimistic with the current market overall and the opportunities for us to continue to expand our portfolio profitably. I mean, now more than ever, it's critical to maintain our focus and discipline. Uh, I would like to read Sage Watson's comments at the beginning of the call and congratulate all our people who continue to, to work effortlessly, execute well, and produce the quality of results that we're sharing with you now. Growing our business is easy. Growing a sustainable and profitable portfolio that we can service, not only just service, but service well, is not always easy. Um, uh, for us, keeping on top of the shifting dynamics in each line and in each territory, and staying selective throughout the market cycle is what we are good at and what we can never lose sight of. And that's what we believe differentiates us, IGI, when it comes to generating strong returns for our shareholders of the longer term. So I'm going to pause here, and we'll turn it over for questions. Operator, we're ready to take the first question, please. We will now begin the question and answer session. To ask a question, you may press star, then 1 on your telephone keypad. If you are using a speakerphone, please pick up your handset before pressing the keys. To withdraw your question, please press star, then 2. If you had queued for a question at the start of the call, we ask that you do so again now to ensure your spot. At this time, we will pause momentarily to assemble our roster. Our first question comes from Roland Mayer of RBC Capital Markets. Go ahead. Hi, good morning. Well, I guess good afternoon over there. Well, Eden Watson, congratulations to both of you on the, the CEO transition. 
Thank you very uh, much. My, Thank you, Roland. Appreciate it. My, my first question is, I, I believe the U.S. property growth is mostly in the Florida panhandle, or Florida just generally. I was wondering if you could walk through a bit about how we should be thinking about cat exposure in the, in the United States. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, inevitably, if you're writing a U.S. property book or business, ENS book, inevitably your um, cat exposures um, are going to be there. Um, uh, we've grown, we've grown quite a bit over the uh, over the last few years. We've we've been in the business now in the market for about three years, and um, uh, we've managed that growth uh, to ensure that we stay within our risk tolerances and cat appetite. Um, obviously, we leverage that with reinsurance, um, so uh, we're very cautious with uh, how we grow, the speed at which we grow at. But there's no doubt that, you know, obviously this location in the U.S. markets are very much directed uh, or located within, you know, the CAT uh, exposed territories. Um, we have dipped our toes in more um, uh, because the conditions are just, uh, uh, you know, best we've ever seen. Um, but we're always mindful and careful with how much we dip our toes in and how we manage the overall exposures and and potential net impact in the event of a uh, uh, what do you call it in the in the event of a of a of a of a big event. That makes sense. And yeah, thank you so much. The the next question is going to be similar. It's on the political violence business. Is there a way to sort of break out what geographic areas you're growing that business into? If anything there? Thank you. Roland, there's no there, there's nowhere specific, uh, to be totally honest with you. I would say we're we're uh, uh, we've grown very well in uh, in, in various parts uh, of the world. There's nothing. There's no one geographical area that stands out as being uh, the big growth spot. I think it's across the board. The Middle East has been very healthy for us on the PV side. Asia, we just. Uh, uh, in the last couple of months, we added resource on the PV side out of our, of our out of our Malaysia office. So we're seeing uh, slowly but surely we're seeing uh, traction there. Uh, uh, and uh, and yeah, I mean the rest is really very much spread out. Thank you. And then if I can get one more in, the annualized investment yield has obviously gone up quite a bit over the last year. Is there a way to give a sort of spread where your new money yields are versus the portfolio and sort of how are you thinking about uh, new investments there? I mean, we continue to be cautious in, in, in how we invest and, and what we invest in. Um, new money is going at anywhere between, you know, four and a half to six percent, uh, usually above five uh, and closer to six. Um, uh, the, the composition of the portfolio will will remain similar to really how it's always been. We're just taking advantage of the higher interest rate environment. That's helpful. Thank you so much for your answers. Pleasure. Thank you. This concludes our question and answer session. I would like to turn the conference back over to management for any closing remarks. Uh, thank you all for uh, joining us today, and thank you for your continued support uh, of IGI. If any of you have any additional questions, please contact Robin, and she'll be happy to assist. I wish you all a great day. Thank you. The conference is now concluded. Thank you for attending today's presentation. You may now disconnect. <laughs>